Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It just suddenly got quiet, so I think it must be time to start. <laughs> um, my name's Sandy Scott, uh, along with Andrea Jones. Uh, we co-own the Galaxy Bookshop, and I just want to say welcome tonight, and that I'm so grateful that we can all gather here together um, to celebrate this book that Brendan worked so hard on, and to celebrate Dave Morris, who loved Hardwick so much, and who Hardwick loved so much in return. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Ross Conley, who wrote the introduction to the book, and is going to provide our introduction this evening. Thank you, Sandy. And it's great to see so many people here. Um, it's a real honor for me to be able to introduce Brendan and, and just talk about the book. Um, I met Dave and when he first came to, back to Vermont, I guess it was 1996, and just feel so fortunate, was able to talk him into coming to work at the Gazette, which he did for 20 years. And um, um, it was just a treat seeing him interacting with him practically every day because Dave spent a lot of time at the newspaper and he'd come in on a weekend and Dave would be at his desk. Um, but anyway, just a little bit about Brendan. We all know Brendan is Dr. Buckley, but um, Brendan also wrote stories over the years for the Gazette, which was really a lot of fun. Um, I think one of the first ones might have been when um, uh, shortly after he and Helen moved to Hardwick, uh, wrote about the, um, he was, accompanying Dr. Pappas, who was the Red Sox team physician, went to spring training, he'd go down and um, help give the players their physicals. And um, I think that might have been even before Dave moved to town. Um, so that's, you know, a side of Brendan and another side to Brendan that um, I never knew much about. I knew he was a sports fan, but he also was quite the athlete, both in high school and in college. Um, in college, he played soccer, um, ice hockey, and, and ran track, so quite an accomplishment. Um, and uh, so it's, he's a, a good person to write about Dave. And I just wanted to say a, a couple things that were so much fun um, uh, working with Dave um, for so many years that, you know, we just talk all the time. and. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, Dave loved ball caps, and he had many ball caps. He had one from Norwich University, he wore a, a lot, uh, Vermont Mountaineers, and um, I don't know who all else, various high schools, obviously from Hazen. Um, he probably had a cap from Crassbury and Twinfield uh, as well, and um, he just liked ball caps, and it was just really fun. And I can remember when my son went to, away to college in Colorado, the um, nickname of the team there was the Tigers. And Dave and I always used to laugh about that because Tigers in Colorado. And he would always talk about, yeah, the Longhorns in Waterbury in high school. <laughs> How do you get a Longhorn in Waterbury? Mm -hmm. and, um, but um, it was, that was just part of the repartee we had. And um, I just got back Saturday. Em and I went out to Montana to visit my son and uh, Laramie to visit her family. And when we were in Missoula, there's an uh, independent league um, uh, baseball team there, a beautiful little park. It used to be a minor league team before major league baseball uh, downsized. Um, but anyway, it's a, a wonderful ballpark and it was a beautiful summer night on our whole trip we had, I think, 20 minutes of rain. Yeah. And, uh, so it was a little different than here. Uh, but anyway, we were in the ballpark and um, sitting there, and, and the name of the team is the Paddleheads. And, um, you know, like, what is a Paddlehead? And the Paddlehead is a moose. And um, um, I was sitting there thinking about Dave. I think about Dave a lot. Um, and was thinking, boy, if Dave were still here, I'd get a paddle head ball cap for him <laughs> to bring back. And he would have absolutely loved it. So um, what I say 
I, Emily bought me this t-shirt, Paddlehead Baseball, Missoula, Montana. So I wear this t-shirt tonight and a Red Sox ball cap <laughs> in memory of Dave and in honor, honor of Brendan for writing this book. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Ross. Um, I'm going to put this down for a moment and just see if people can hear me. And if it doesn't work, we'll certainly use it. Can people hear me? Yeah. Sure. No. OK. Yeah. All right. I saw one shake of a head. That's enough. I'll, I'll go this way. Um, so good evening, and, and thank you for being here. I am so excited to be at the stage where I can at last uh, share Dave's story uh, with the wider Vermont audience, but particularly with our community here uh, who knew Dave so well, who loved Dave, and uh, were certainly loved deeply in return. Uh, so it's wonderful to have this opportunity. Um, I won't delve chapter and verse into Dave's biography tonight. Um, probably somebody wrote a book about that that you could read. Um, but I will share the story behind the book um, and that will reveal some of his biography as I do that. Um, I don't know the moment that I first felt I needed to, to tell Dave's story, um, but I imagine it was sometime between February 2014 when Aaron uh, helped put on an appreciation night for Dave, uh, and then just barely a year later when Dave died, um, I did have a chance to speak with Dave and tell him that I wanted to tell his story. Uh, it wasn't a project that I could really start on until I completed work at the health center. So it was about 2018, 2019 that I uh, finally began. Um, but the, the title, The Morse Code, was branded in my brain from the get-go. Uh, I never really seriously considered any other title, uh, although the publisher for several weeks kept throwing different ideas out because they were worried that people would think it was a World War II spy novel <laughs> or that it was about the Morse code. Um, but my reasons for writing the Morse code uh, were A, that was his column that we all knew and loved. and. Um, may have been a leading reason for many people to go and grab the paper every Wednesday. Um, and then the code that Dave lived by, which uh, I think was most deeply felt in this community uh, in the way that he cared about people and the way that he reached out to people, particularly many of the athletes that he covered. Um, Dave himself, here we go wrote that in a Morse code at one point. I hope my message is clear, show respect of young people in particular, and it will come back to serve you well, be part of their lives every day. And I would add shining a light on the kids, uh, the power of community, and paying it forward. Uh, and the paying it forward I'll come back to in a moment. Um, I wanted just to remind everyone, uh, this is Dave on the occasion of his appreciation night when he was given an opportunity by John Sperry, who was MC that evening, to say a few words. Um, and again, it's hard uh, not to feel the emotion uh, as he speaks. As he speaks. <laughs> I have planned to change the future. Oh. I actually know everyone here. It's the greatest feeling for you to come into this building and see Timmy share. Everybody knows St. Tristan Southworth's family. I would be remiss in not 
crediting Vanessa for the photograph she takes to make the copy look better. <laughs> um, I, I did try to hear of them, but I have mentioned the Aaron a couple of times. Uh, yes, it's been 20 years, early February, early this month, because Aaron keeps track of those things. Uh, that's how important this is to this community. And if I ever made a good decision in my life, it was coming to heart. I mean that with all my heart. Uh, I was born in Lawrenceville. You believe that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I compared I, my first newspaper job with the Times Harvest with the great Henry Pierce. I worked with Ken Squire. Uh, I covered those great Spalding teams that you sometimes hear about, even if it wasn't 1962, three or four or something like that. This outsurpasses anything, and I could get Fredrickson to say that in one fire. We, we don't figure to ever lose. A good day, yeah, you're going to get beat a couple times, but you're going to come back the next day and win. And that's what the old you know, people all about this group. And, you know, I just caught her in home. <laughs> Coach Hill was asking me about great things that have happened. Remember he shot against Williamstown in the just in the Southworth Day. That's what this town is all about. People coming out, sharing. Um, no, I'm not going to write a more story about this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for Brittany to do what she did, because we all know, every, and the quote from Travis is so important. Everybody's in it together. Always have been, always will be. Waller was the same way at Cabot. Those guys tore the roof off the auditorium. That, that has to be shown around town as special gatherings because that's what this town is all about, always will be about. Uh -huh. to miss the emotion there and the caring. I was one of the people who spoke that night thanking Dave for what he'd done uh, and I actually encouraged him to write a book because of the breadth and scope of Vermont sports history that he covered in his lifetime uh, and it's quite a list but of course that would have been a book about Vermont sports and not a book about Dave. Uh, and I felt it was time to shine the light on Dave uh, and share his caring, his dedication, his expertise as a reporter, uh, and particularly his relationship with this community. Um, so I'll give you a sense of how the book opens because it opens at that, uh, at that event. 
On a raw northern Vermont night in February 2014, more than 200 sports fans headed out into the weather. They left behind their TVs, which offered highlights of the Olympic Games in Sochi and the number eight Duke men's basketball team grinding out a 69-67 win over Maryland. Instead, the fans gathered in the Hazen Union School Auditorium in Hardwick, Vermont. Aaron Hill, coach of the boys' high school basketball team, had organized the occasion. He'd invited Dave Morse, sports writer and editor for the local weekly Hardwick Gazette, to a team gathering, ostensibly to thank Dave for his coverage of the team, and particularly for his efforts to acknowledge the contributions of every player throughout the season. In truth, the event had been planned to give area athletes across all sports and their families an opportunity to express their thanks to a man whose mission over the previous 20 years had been, in his words, to shine a light on the kids. Dave's beat at the Gazette spanned as many as 10 towns, none larger than 3,000 people. The towns are tucked in the hills around and along the Lamoille River Valley. Many are connected by meandering, sketchily paved, or dirt roads. A one-man sports department, Dave covered a dizzying array of events across the region. A search of the Gazette archives yields stories covering the typical cross-section of school sports from elementary to college. Beyond the playing fields of academe, Dave covered youth leagues, wiffle ball contests, summer soccer and softball games, and snowmobile races. Farther afield, he reported from Thunder Road, a stock car track in Barry, from the Crassbury Outdoor Center, breeding ground for national and Olympic level scholars and Nordic skiers, and from Montpelier, where the Vermont Mountaineers a collegiate league baseball team, summered. He drove to the top of the Appalachian Gap in the Green Mountains to witness a local cyclist compete. It was not unusual for him to travel to Dartmouth College, the University of Vermont, or other state colleges to follow homegrown athletes as they competed at the next level. As I began to delve into Dave's history, I thought I had a pretty simple task of talking to his family about his childhood, of talking to people he'd worked with through his life about his professional life before he came to Hardwick. And then I felt I had a pretty good handle on those 20 years, but I had a wealth of people around me who could fill me in on details I didn't know or good stories about Dave. Um, my first interview was with his sister, Deanna. Um, and she let me know within minutes of sitting on her couch that she and Dave had been separated for much of their childhood um, because it was a rough upbringing and I'll tell you a bit about that in a moment. Um, and then she informed me that in Dave's midlife, quote, we lost Dave for a few years, end quote, uh, by which she was referring to a period of seven or eight years, but which in fact when I went back in time was really a 20 year period of time that it was difficult to know exactly where Dave was or what he was doing. Um, and so I described that um, a little bit later in that opening piece. The tale of Dave's precocious success and acclaim achieved following a childhood of emotional upheaval and tragic loss is complicated and until now known only to Morse himself. It involves a fleeting love story, the demise of which triggered a breakdown, and in turn, his years-long disappearance and isolation from friends, from family, from sports, from Vermont. He disappeared without a word and eventually into homelessness before finding his way back. The years 1994 to 2014 represented a resurrection, one that he had not anticipated or planned for, one that resulted from a chance encounter, one that took place in one of the last places he might have imagined. Of the 200 plus people in Hazen Union Auditorium that frigid February night, with two decades of shared history and conversation, only Dave knew the whole story. So the code that was my second meaning of the title, where and when did that develop? So the first 10 years of Dave's life, he was the eldest of four. His mom worked 
down at Brattleboro Retreat. They lived in Waterbury, so she was away for days at a time, working shifts and then coming back. His dad was a pretty absent parent uh, due to drinking bouts and chasing women, uh, and was a pretty unreliable father. Um, the result being over those first 10 years that the lives of these four children were pretty disjointed, uh, spending time with relatives, either maternal grandparents in Morrisville, a paternal aunt and uncle in Waterbury, rarely were the four kids together. Uh, Dave's mom contracted tuberculosis and died when Dave was about 10 years old. Um, this is Dave on the right with his younger brother Don. This picture was on the wall at Deanna's apartment. And the other side of the frame were Deanna and the youngest brother Dex. Same setting, all four kids in their snow outfits, all four kids beaming ear to ear. But this was a rare moment in their lives. Deanna remembers it as perhaps a six month period of time when their father was a farmhand uh, in Waitsfield and they were living in hired hand quarters. Um, so they actually were together as a family of six. And then uh, Dave's father lost his job because he was drunk on the job. And once again, the family uh, dissolved into a scattered arrangement. After Dave's mom's death, things actually settled down a bit. And Dave and Don uh, went fairly permanently into the Waterbury home of his uncle Rex, who was his father's older brother. Uh, and Rex had been a World War II hero, uh, was a significant uh, character in Waterbury. The armory there uh, bears his name today. He started the local regiment. Uh, and he gave David and Don a stable home. The other two, Diana and Dex, went to the maternal grandparents in Morrisville. So they, again, the four children were not often together, occasionally for weekend gatherings. Um, but this stable environment allowed Dave to come in contact with a number of people who, who set him on a course for life. Uh, and I see this as sort of three threads beginning to take place. The first was a professional thread uh, that you'll see led to the work he ultimately did. Um, the second was the code that he chose to live by through the people that he was exposed to. And the third was the fallout, I think, from those first 10 years of an emotional and psychological flaw that plagued him till the end. Um, the people that he met were first Rex, who provided a stable home, an image of a responsible parent, um, and who pr also provided a fairly stern, disciplined environment at home. Rex enabled Dave and his brother to go to Camp Abnaki which was a summer camp in Lake Champlain. Dave probably went there for the first time around age 11 or 12. Uh, and he went there every summer till well after his high school graduation. So first as a camper, then as a counselor, and ultimately sort of beyond counselor to just helping Clyde Hess, who ran the camp, run the camp. Uh, people describe Dave as his right-hand man uh, in those later years. Um, the motto of the camp was help the other fellow. Clyde Hess very specifically wanted to minimize the sense of competition at camp. He was quoted as saying, when it, wherever you have a winner, you create a loser. So it was all about cooperation and working together. And if you look back at the old handbooks that counselors would get before they came to work, it was emphasis always on that. Uh, and on really accommodating kids uh, in every way possible. Um, and then the third influence was a man named Dak Rowe. 
who was the principal at Waterbury High School. He was a World War I veteran. He'd been a German POW. Uh, he came back uh, and went into education and in the late 20s was made the principal of Waterbury High School. And he stayed in that role beyond Dave's graduation in 1956. Um, the Waterbury High School cross country team in the early 50s was a powerhouse. They actually won the New England championships. Um, and one of Dave's good buddies, Lefty Sia, his older brother was on that team. So, you know, as with good teams, Aaron will tell you kids want to play basketball at Hazen. And at Waterbury High School, there were kids interested in running cross country because the team was so good. So Dave and, his, and Lefty went out for the team. And Dave wrote in the Hardwick Gazette, I tried out for the cross country team, took a wrong turn, literally took a wrong turn. <laughs> and, and he said, and Dak Rowe, no, he said Mr. Rowe, Mr. Rowe made me his manager. Um, <laughs> and but there he went. He was manager of the cross country team. He became manager of the basketball team. He became manager of the baseball team. Uh, and in that role, he was looking after his, his teammates, but he was also connecting to newspapers and radio stations after the game, calling in scores, calling in results, highlights, statistics. Um, and so that set him on that path. He graduated from Waterbury High School in 56. He took a stab at college at the Burnett Business School in Boston. Uh, didn't last. He'll tell you he spent more time in Fenway Park than he did in school. I don't doubt it. Um, and, but when this happened, and he knew he wasn't doing well, and he knew the school wasn't pleased, he didn't tell anyone. Um, and that became his pattern through life, was when things went wrong, Dave would retreat. Um, and it was only by a letter his uncle Rex had died just before he graduated, but his Aunt Emma received a letter explaining that Dave needn't bother coming back. Um, and Emma told Dave that was okay, but he needed to work for her taxi service in Waterbury, paying back the tuition that she had sent to the school in Boston. Um, and he told her, I want to be a sports reporter. And, she blessed that, but made sure that he paid back his tuition. So he started his career. This is Rex and Emma's house on Main Street in Waterbury. There's Camp Abnaki helped the other fellow. There's Dave as we all remember him. <laughs> That's his high school senior photo. There's Dave upper right with the staff of WDEV. This was really his first job. He started there more in administration, uh, but eventually got on air uh, doing a midday sports report and also in traveling around to schools as DEV was, bro was broadcasting basketball games. Um, such that when he arrived here many, many years later, uh, his first column in the Gazette talks about, oh yeah, I remember that's where we set up the radio equipment and so this was not unfamiliar territory. There wasn't much of Vermont that was unfamiliar to Dave by the time he was done. Um, so Dave, through his career, by the age of 29, with a couple of stops after WDEV, was at the Rutland Herald as sports editor. 29 years old, sports editor of the Rutland Herald, which the people there at the time will tell you was the best small town newspaper in America. That might be debatable, but it's a remarkable list of alumni who worked there, who went on to Newsday on Long Island, to The New Yorker, to editing the big St. Louis paper, to Lowell, Massachusetts. It included uh, Howard Coffin, who went to work for Senator Jeffers, who's considered Vermont's expert, Civil War historian expert, uh, and Howard was adamant that it was the best little newspaper in, little small town newspaper in America. So there was Dave, um, and there are two 
themes that emerged in his Rutland years, which were 1966 to 1974. Uh, and the first is just his level of professional accomplishment. Uh, in between Dave's death and my beginning to write this book, I was volunteering at the Outdoor Center for one of uh, a ski event one winter day in 2016. Uh, and a man walked into the office where we were all gathering and everybody clearly knew who he was, I didn't. Um, and he's chatting about last weekend's races and this and that and I wasn't sure who he was and just had my head down. Uh, and then he said, anyone here know Dave Morse? Uh, and immediately I was all ears. Um, and I said, I knew Dave, I, you know, but he died last year. Um, and this man said he did more for cross-country skiing in Vermont than anybody else. Um, now, in 1997, shortly after Dave was here, the NCAA championships were bumped to Crassberry because traps didn't have enough snow. Um, so it was a big deal. Um, the outdoor center was a little smaller and less geared up than it is today. Um, but I went up to watch. It was going to be a wonderful event. And there was Dave, the little, you know, three by five note, spiral notebook and his pen dashing around. Uh, and I remember looking over at this older guy. I didn't know Dave very well then and thinking to myself, he's probably never been at a ski event before. He does basketball and baseball and football. So stupid me when <laughs> Peter Graves tells me he's done more for skiing than anyone else in Vermont. Um, but I'll read you uh, what Peter said. He describes a moment, and obviously Dave's still alive, I think it was about 2013, uh, when there was a big sports banquet down in Montpelier. Um, and Peter, had been a very successful Nordic ski jumper, had gone out west to college, and then had parlayed his connections to the ski world into becoming an announcer so that you would have seen him on television for the 84 Olympics as ABC's Nordic jumping uh, expert. And he was in Crassbury the day that we met because he was a PA announcer for big ski events. Um, so he was a well-known figure. As a prominent figure in Vermont sports, he was invited to the Vermont Principals Association Hall of Fame ceremony in 2013. He recalled being seated next to an elderly gentleman and introducing himself. Yes, I know who you are, the man replied. I used to cover you in competition. I'm Dave Morse. Remembers Graves, it was a powerful moment. He was a hero of mine. I got up and gave him a hug. I remembered a quote from my ski coach, Peter, your heart is smiling. It was true that night. I said to Dave, you did so much, and here tonight maybe not everybody remembers, but I remember, and thank you. That was very, very powerful because I didn't know if I would see this guy again. That was very important to me. Graves cried later when we talked about this, as he recalled Dave's coverage of Nordic skiing during those heady days in southern Vermont, John Caldwell, who many would say was the father of Nordic skiing in the United States, was at the Putney School. He had previously been an Olympic competitor, and he began to develop the core of the early days in the 60s uh, of Vermont Nordic skiing that we might remember culminating with Billy Koch in 1976 winning a, a silver medal. Um, and Peter was from Bennington, so he was going back and forth there. Um, but he remembers just reading Dave avidly and how respected he, how much respect he had for Dave. Um, interestingly, if you read Dave's version of those events. Here's what, he, here's what Dave said. Now Graves, you say, 
we sat at the same table and it was the same Graves who skied for Mount Anthony Union High, as I remember from my Rutland Herald days. He was there to honor his mentor, Berger Vignes. And then he goes on, Graves is married, he's coaches, so nothing about this guy <laughs> hugged me and cried, <laughs> telling me how wonderful I was. Dave would never tell you that. Um, so from that association with cross-country skiing, Dave was the only Vermont journalist who went to the 1968 Winter Olympics in Grenoble. Um, and so you think about what he had accomplished through the, the, even those years of Vermont sports, starting in 1962-63 through 1974. He was the guy on the cross-country ski scene at the Winter Olympics. He was there at Thunder Road, he helped build Thunder Road with Ken Squire. He told you that earlier how he covered those great Spalding teams. They were a powerhouse uh, that I think won four in a row and then lost to Bennington Catholic in the fifth, I think, <laughs> anyway. Uh, but Dave was there. Um, he covered Legion Ball. With which Dave Brown and the Dimmick brothers played on the Barry team against a guy named Pudge Fisk. Uh, but Dave was there when Pudge was playing minor league ball in upstate New York, and Dave was at the Herald. He'd go out and cover those games. There was a game where Fisk was playing catcher. Guy got in a rundown between third and home. Big collision. Fisk goes down and is hurt. Dave brings him to the hospital. Um, so he'd made a mark by 1974. Um, the second thing that happened in Rutland was he met a woman named Marietta Munlin, who was a singer, pianist. Uh, she had a, a traveling gig, so she was hardly there all the time, but her Rutland gig was at the Bardwell Hotel which I think was a watering hole for Rutland Herald staff after work. Um, it's not clear exactly when Dave and Marietta met, unless Mike corrects me, but um, they married in 1973. They may have met as early as sometime in the 60s. Um, but the marriage didn't last. She left in less than a year. Um, and Dave's life went off the rails uh, and he disappeared overnight. So from sports editor of the Rutland Herald, he was gone uh, without a word. Ted Ryan, who went on to work at the Free Press, was Dave's co-worker in the sports department in those days. And he remembers being home. There was no Sunday paper, but so all this weekend sports news piled under the Monday edition. And one of them would always go every Sunday night and put the, the, the sports section together for the next day. And they just alternated Sundays. Ted was home one evening in September, early October 1974, and as was called by the editors, where's Dave? And uh, Ted said, oh, I'm sure he's there. No, no, the lights are off. Ted just assumed Dave had forgotten the schedule. He went in, put the Monday paper together, but then another day went by, no Dave, no Dave, no Dave. So Dave was gone, um, and that was a mystery that I did my best to resolve, uh, certainly not completely to my satisfaction. Um, at about this time in my research, COVID hit. Uh, suddenly I couldn't go to interview people. Libraries were closed. The state archives was closed. Um, Dawn mercifully let me upstairs at the Gazette so that I could start going through old Gazettes. Uh, and my mission there was to read every Morse code for 20 plus years because Dave would put little hints in. He'd tell you a story about, I saw Jackie Robinson play in this game, I saw this event, and I just tried to find any little piece that would tell me where he was somewhere in this 20 year period of time. 
never complete with your my satisfaction. The other thing I did when COVID hit was I just said, well, I guess I'll write. Initially, I thought I would research everything, have every moment birth to death laid out in front of me and then write the story. But since I was stuck at home, I just decided, well, I'll write what I know. And that actually went better than I thought it would. Um, I had a dear friend, Len Shapiro, uh, who had a career as a sports writer with the Washington Post. Um, he actually was kind enough to put the little blurb on the cover, make it look good. Um, but he was, he was a wonderful advocate for this effort uh, and a wonderful counselor. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to him. Um, so in 1994, Dave reemerges. Um, and he's in Morrisville. His sister's there, and they've tried to put Dave back on his feet because he had been homeless in New York. He arrived with a toilet kit and the clothes on his back when he finally came back to Vermont. Uh, and he worked odd jobs around Morrisville, Cumbies, Kaplan's. Uh, and one day, Ken Burnham, went shopping. And Ken was a star athlete in the early 60s at Hardwick Academy. And he went shopping and recognized the guy at the checkout counter as the sports writer from the Times Argus who used to cover the Hardwick Academy team. Uh, and Ross was going to need a sports writer. Uh, and Ken told Dave, you ought to go talk to Ross. Uh, and, you know, maybe he could use you. Um, and I really believe that Dave had no idea that he might one day become a sports writer again. Um, and when we think of how much he meant to this community over 20 years, uh, but to that point in his life, he'd only been a sports journalist for barely a decade. Um, so it was a magical, uh, circumstance that brought him into our midst. Um, the last part of putting this book together was gathering stories from athletes here. Um, and it wasn't easy. Um, they're busy. They have young families. They're new careers. Uh, they would tell you how I hounded them and hounded them. And Aaron will tell you how I told him to hound them <laughs> so that they would talk to me. And, and I had almost given up hope more than once. Uh, I knew these guys had wonderful stories to tell. If only I could get them for a little while. Um, and finally, the dam broke. Um, and I woke up one morning to an email from Brad Mader, who lives in the Northwest. So it wasn't there when I went to bed, but sometime in the middle of the night when he was still awake and I was asleep, he sent me an email. Um, and I want to read that to you. It is a tough endeavor, as I'm sure you are aware, to capture the story of a man who consistently made the story about everyone around him. Dave was always there, always. I don't mean that in any passive way. In truth, Dave's way of being present and supportive was possibly the most stark example of selflessness that I have had the privilege to experience. When you had a bad game or were generally struggling, he was there with encouraging words to lift your spirits. And when the opposite was true, he would celebrate your accomplishments. He was never the loudest voice in the stands or someone who would rush you at the end of the game, but he was always quietly there, attentive and supporting. He would always include the facts of the event, but never resorted to focusing on any individual failure. Even when things didn't go our way, he always focused on the positives, outstanding performances by opposing teams and players, outstanding performances that just came up short, displays of sportsmanship, etc. This was true in person as well. It's not uncommon for a high school athlete to have a rough game or series of games. And Dave was always there to listen to you and reassure you that you would overcome. 
I do not think there's a way for me to accurately state or even know the positive impact that knowing Dave has had on my life, but I know that it is significant. I could truly not have more respect or love for the man. He was a great and selfless friend, and he is dearly missed. And I, I was just, whoa, thank you, Brad. And, and I wrote him an email and said, thank you, this is wonderful. And then he wrote another long email, which included this little message. So Dave was very instrumental in helping many basketball players get to summer camps, driving them to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Fordham, New York, uh, often contributing monetarily so that they could get there. Um, and Brad went to one of those camps, uh, and he said, and he describes a day at the camp where he just he was playing poorly. I mean, as good as Hazen is, they, they played some tough competition when they went to these camps. Um, he was overwhelmed by the physicality of the other players. During drills on the second day, he was amazed to see Dave standing courtside, quote, a 10-hour drive from Hardwick, end quote. Although his play improved somewhat from that point, Brad still fell short of a strong performance. Nevertheless, he remembered, I can say with certainty that Dave showing up that weekend at a time when I felt lonely and discouraged and offering a friendly face and words of encouragement was more impactful than he will ever know. I'm just going to catch you up with a few photos. So this is the Middlebury Panther soccer team, September 1972, article by Dave Morse with my name in it, <laughs> misspelled. Uh, <laughs> So, but I, I won't hold that against him. Um, so uh, I have a quiz. Howard Coffin told a story of being at the Rutland Herald office late one night. Dave bursts in the door. I've just seen the best basketball player ever to play in the state of Vermont. And Howard said, Dave, you know, the Boston Celtics play exhibition games in high schools in Vermont. Kuzi, Havlicek, Russell, really? You just saw the best player ever to play in Vermont? And Dave said, I've just seen the best player ever to play in Vermont. Who had he seen? Aaron Who? Aaron <laughs> Good guess, good guess. <laughs> Sorry? Henry Dowling. No. Julius Irving. Yeah. Bingo. The doctor playing for UMass against UVM in Burlington. Um, and Howard said, maybe Dave was right. <laughs> I won't get into that debate. Um, there's a high school picture of Marietta. Uh, there's one of the Rutland Herald just billing for her appearance. She always went by just Marietta. I tracked, I follow her to Maine um, and Similarly, her building was always just Marietta. Uh, this, I learned that Marietta grew up in Ohio, in Wyoming, Ohio, uh, which is just outside of Cincinnati. Uh, and when I found her obituary in Maine, and it mentioned two sons uh, who were from Ohio. And I came home and said to Helen, who has Facebook, could you put these names <laughs> and just see what we come up with? Um, and they were Will and Wynn Munlin, M-U-N-L-I-N, was the man, was the father of her children. Uh, and one popped up, a Will Munlin in Cincinnati, uh, and I sent him a message. Uh, are you Marietta's son? Um, we had radio silence for a little while longer than I wanted, but then Helen said, you got to reply. Uh, and it said, no, I'm Marietta's, Marietta's my grandmother. Um, so we had some back and forth. I happened to be heading across country with a, with a friend. Cincinnati's on the way to Colorado. Uh, so this is Will Munlin Jr. Uh, on the left, his mom on the right. So it, that's the woman who would have married Marietta's son and then Will's daughters in the middle. Um, he 
was a good enough baseball player that around 2000, 2001, he was playing in the Cape Cod League. And if Dave had known that Marietta's grandson was playing baseball in Cape Cod, how quickly would Dave have been down there? And then this is Marietta's gravestone in Bath, Maine, uh, with some musical notes. Uh, she died fairly young, at about age 55 or 56. Um, these are photos as Dave finally emerged back in Vermont. That's his Aunt Emma. There's the Dave we knew and loved at the diner, holding court. There's the Morse code. Honest answer, how many people knew that was dash dot dot dash dash DM underneath? All right, Nance. Yes. Later. <laughs> I, I didn't know. I can't remember who told me, but I didn't know it at the time. Um, these are some famous Hardwick youth. Uh, Marty Schneider in the Cleveland Indians, Jake Clark in the New York Yankees, Matthew Buckley in the Boston Red Sox, <laughs> two of their friends, and, and Dave. That was at Carlton Fisk's Hall of Fame induction weekend. Uh, and I love this photo. I wanted this one on the cover, but um, they nixed it. And he would go and watch practice, and Ryan Reno told me that the level of play I always went up when Dave came in. Um, and then Dave was honored at Norwich University uh, on their media day as sports writer of the year. And many Hardwick folk were there to celebrate that occasion. This is Hayes and Union's class of 06 dedication to Dave. He considered this one of the greatest honors he ever received. This is Tristan Southworth showing us number 42. He and Dave bonded over their love of Jackie Robinson. Um, and, and Dave actually gave Tristan uh, a biography of Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson played in the first game that Dave ever saw his senior year in high school. And he wrote in the Gazette, actually, I think this probably was from a down and out period in his life. He was working at like a horn and hard odd or chock full of nuts or something in New York. And Rachel Robinson, Jackie's widow, came in. And I think Dave was pretty flipped out to be able to bring her a piece of pie. Or, um, there's Tim Shedd, who I was so hoping would be here tonight, um, but he couldn't make it. But Tim uh, and Dave had a very special uh, friendship over the years. And then Brittany Lumsden, on his appreciation night, presented Dave with this beautiful portrait uh, and the frame was signed by most people in attendance. Um, before I finish, uh, in 2018, Dave was inducted into the Vermont Sports Hall of Fame. Um, and Mike Donahue was there. This is Mike who knew Dave when he was a college, when, Dave, when Mike was a college student and Dave was at the Rutland Herald. And Mike would do stringing journalism work for Dave. Um, but Mike roped me into going up and accepting the plaque uh, with very little warning, Mike. Uh, and I'd never been to th such an occasion before, and I didn't realize it was like Oscar night. So that the people who got up to accept their own awards went on and on. And, and I just was so off guard. And I think Dave was like the second award that night. And, I know I didn't do him justice because I spoke for about 90 seconds. And um, at any rate, and but this, <laughs> and and this is Dave's sister Deanna, holding the Hall of Fame plaque. She was so in on this story from the get-go. She actually accompanied me when I went to interview Ken Squire. She just wanted to know about her big brother when he was a kid. She had missed so much of it. Um, I also just want to give a shout out to Helen for being my guide. She's heard every word of this book about 47 times. Uh, she heard this presentation too many times. Um, and to our daughter, Emma, who literally was on the phone from work a little while ago helping us rig all of this up. Um, so I just want to read to you from the end of the book. Um, it's about that picture. 
that you've seen before, and this picture that you haven't seen before. But this is Billy Welcome's wedding uh, in upstate New York. And so that's several Hazen basketball alumni celebrating Dave. Um, and Dave wrote about that. Sorry, I lost my little sticky. This is Dave's relating of this moment. A reunion of one of Hazen Union's most glorious eras, primarily the 2000 group. And this would have been the group of boys who really arrived at Hazen Middle School when Dave arrived at the Gazette. So he really sort of, it was the first group that he really followed. This tale starts even five or six years before then. That's about my time frame here too. Mike Burnham and Xander Calderwood joined us for what I guess passes as a mash on the shore of the river. We are the wildcats, mighty, mighty wildcats. Once a wildcat, always a wildcat. Someone took my camera. I indulged in dancing and high fives only. By now the band was playing. Six hours after the exchanging of vows, ocean-going barges passing in the night up the St. Lawrence River, the lights of Prescott, Ontario on the other side. There's 17 to 18 years and 10 hours, and you're on your own again. David turned 75 in May of that year. For much of his life, love had proven an elusive presence. He had glimpsed it in childhood and at occasional holidays with siblings, nieces, and nephews through adulthood. In midlife, his wife had abruptly abandoned him, and he'd passed the ensuing two decades mostly alone. Surely on that 2012 summer evening, he recognized that his life and work had made a difference in the lives of others, and he felt the love and caring which he had demonstrated for others for so many years returned. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions, or if somebody knows something I don't know about those 20 years, please tell us. Maybe there'll be a second edition. <laughs> but thank you all for being here. It was lovely. No questions? Okay. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.